ninth pick in the 1998 NBA draft, Dirk Nowitzki from Würzburg, Germany. Spectacular number 41, Nowitzki. What defines a legend? A double touch, big shots. Moments of triumph and joy. History making comeback. That's back in Wakefield. Moments of struggle and growth. It's Nowitzki, his first big league field goal. Dirk for 20 seasons, the Dallas Mavericks have been defined by one man, a skinny German kid who rose to be an all-time great. Legends are created by memories born of effort and passion. These moments connect us to our heroes. Are we really seeing this? Moments where we are lifted beyond the ordinary. The defining moments of Dirk. Twenty seasons. That's a long time to play in the NBA. Only seven players in the history of the league have played that long. And only two have accomplished that feat with one team. One of them calls the city of Dallas home. Dirk Nowitzki has been the face of the Mavericks for a generation. During that journey, Dirk has had some truly great moments. Memorable games, incredible finishes, and fantastic plays that have established him as one of the all-time greats in the history of basketball. Over the course of the next hour, we will sit down with Dirk and talk to him about some of these moments and get his thoughts and opinions about why they were so special. Let's begin with a look at the defining moments of Dirk. Dirk, let's talk about when you first came over to Dallas. Drafted back in 1998. Dirk Nowitzki from Würzburg, Germany. Here you are coming into Dallas. What were your first impressions when you got here? Uh, I was a little scared, or not scared, I mean really anxious, didn't really know what to expect. So I got in the airport and there was all these fans with signs waiting. I thought back then, and man, that's cool, there's a bunch of fans here. I found out later that all these people were Mavs employees. Ross Perot told them all to go out there and give me a welcome. Nelly made it all comfortable for me. Uh, you know how easygoing he was and how nice and uh, always joking and having fun with everything, just making me feel comfortable. And, you know, there was a little bit of a language barrier, obviously, and I was a little shy at the beginning in my press conferences. Getting to meet uh, Steve and Mike was big that trip. You know, Nelly had a little barbecue at his house and got to, got to meet some of the players. And they were super nice and, and kind of made me feel welcome and, and, and said, hey, let's let's try this, let's do this. Getting to meet Steve was uh, was big, so uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a nice trip. And then at the end, at my last press conference, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm coming, I'll do this. So it was, uh, it was a big step for me. You said a minute ago that meeting Steve was really important, and we know how influential he was. Did you know that day when you met him at the press conference that this is going to be my guy? Not really, but he was he was really nice, loved soccer, so immediately we clicked on that area and started talking. You know, he just had gotten traded here. He was he played in Phoenix, so everything here was was new to him too. We ended up living in the same apartment complex and it just uh I mean that was those were the good old days, you know, I had some fun. And, you know, he always took me out of the apartment, took me to eat, took me to movies. Dallas Mavericks. One fan at a time. Met some of his <laughs> friends on the road, all his college buddies. and stuff to do and uh, not only sit in an hotel room and think about home. Him and Mike were both fantastic, true pros, and really, you know, taught me taught me the right way in this league. Your first game in Seattle and Detlef Shrimp happened to be on the Sonics that particular night. What do you remember about interacting with him? He was super sweet to me. I didn't really know, you know, what to expect there either. Uh, I know I was very nervous. First game. Huge stage, and then against the the German who's made it, you know, all-star, sixth man of the year, I think twice. I mean, he's had an amazing career. In the warm-ups, we took a picture together, and so it was, it was super surreal. Tons of German media there. In the locker room before, which which I wasn't used to, uh, you kind of getting dressed, and there's tons of cameras there. And, uh, just everything was just so new and weird. Nowitzki at the point, being chased by Shrimp. Detlef was, was super sweet. Met his wife afterwards. 
He gave me his number. He's like, anything you ever need, any questions, give me a call. I'll, I'll help you through it. And uh, he was he was super nice. So I couldn't I couldn't ask for more. Was there anybody else that stands out early in your career that was a mentor for you? Nelly and Donnie were great. You know, Donnie was the guy that was coaching the Hoop Summit, so he uh, he kind of knew me uh, the longest. And you know, he was an assistant at the time, so. I mean, we must have watched countless hours of film that year, you know, just trying to get me better and help me out in, in all sorts of areas where, where I was struggling. So I spent a lot of time with, with Donnie. And a lot of people try to help me get, get through the first, first step. December of 2004, American Airlines Center. Houston comes into town, and you and Tracy McGrady have one of the great one-on-one -on -one duels ever. You score 53, he scores 48. You guys went in overtime. What do you remember about it? I remember actually that game that uh, I was not shooting the ball particularly well in warm-ups, so I, I didn't really quite know how this was going to go. My teammates kept finding me. And once you're in the rhythm and you're in a groove, some shots fall that you know usually don't go, and that's part of it. But it was just a fun night, fun atmosphere. Uh, and T-Mac was on fire. The best thing about high scoring nights is always to get to win, you know. Um, I had another 50 point game in the regular season that we actually lost, uh, which makes you sick. 50 is a big number, it's a special number. Did you ever think about the possibility of doing something like that, scoring 50 points in an NBA game because it's been done by so few, relatively speaking? Yeah, no, not really, especially after the start that uh, we talked about earlier. I um, mean, my first year was, was rough, and I wasn't quite sure if, if I'm made for this. I figured, hey, fight through the first contract, and if it doesn't work, I can always go back to Europe and uh, play there, play close to my mom and dad, which they wanted anyways. The second year was already better, and then I could see, hey, you know, maybe you can play in this league, and then kind of just kept working. You know, I think that's, that's the main thing every summer. You know, played national, international ball, uh, worked with Holger, only took a few weeks off, and always always try to get better, always try to add new things. And then the team started to get better with Steve and Mike, and all of a sudden we, we brought the playoffs back here in Dallas. Up ahead to Nowitzki, and Dirk's got the jam. So it was just a, just a fun, fun time to be around here and, and building this thing kind of from ground up. Nice, nice, nice. Nowitzki, the youngster, taking the ball to the basket. When you came into the league, there weren't a lot of players like you, Dirk. Bigs who could step outside and shoot. One of the first stretch fours. Did you ever think, I'm so much different than the way people play in this league at this particular position? Well, I think there were some that uh, that paved the way for me. I think we, we mentioned that Lefremf, who was, who was a big guy who could step out. Uh, Kukoc was a big guy who can, who can move and, and shoot. So. I think there were some Euros before me that, that a little bit paved the way. It's Nowitzki. Catch and shoot. It's so easy. There's Nowitzki. Now it's Nowitzki for three. I always say, I'm not sure if, if there were a lot of coaches at the time in the late 90s that uh, would have had a seven-footer, you know, get a rebound, dribble it up, and and jack up a three and and Nelly just always let me play my game gave me the confidence and always saw that I, I was never going to be a traditional big you know um, so that was his vision for me is, is being a perimeter shooting driving a lot I'm just glad that, uh, that that I came here and it worked out and he supported me fully you know You dreamed of the chance to get the triple-double, and here it is, your first one. What do you remember about it? Hot pass for Nowitzki. You know, I always like to think I was never, I never got paid for my passing, you know. I always got paid to, to get buckets. When I have two triple-doubles in 20 years, that's not a lot, you know. On that particular night, I was playing well offensively, and if you're in the NBA, it's always a dream to kind of get a triple-double because it's uh, filling the stat sheet. It's always a fun thing to do. I didn't really think that I was going to achieve that since my passing. And like I said, isn't isn't Carl Malone-esque. Uh, somehow I got it done, and the guys were great making shots that night. 
Dirk, the 2006 playoffs were a pretty special run. San Antonio, game seven. You guys have a big lead on the road. You have to win in overtime. You get over the hump. Everybody remembers the three-point play, but you had a 37.15 rebound game. What do you remember looking at this? For seven-game span, this was probably the best series I've, I've ever played in my life. I was in my prime. You know, I like, like to think 27 to 30 is, is your prime in hoops because you're, you're experienced. You have a few years under your belt, and but your body is still... Uh, ready and primed and that series was uh, was a great series against an, an unbelievable team against our rivals that always beat up on us and uh, to go down there and, and beat them in seven on their home court was uh, was an amazing feeling just just a roller coaster ride as it always is uh, we're up big we're rolling and, and how they always you know play hard and get back in it and then Ginobili makes the three on the wing Ginobili for three yes thought that was it. I'm going to somehow get to the basket here and then lay it in. Nowitzki goes right at Bowen. And the foul! And we're down one. We could foul him. Maybe they miss a free throw. And, and, and that's what I did. Just kind of put my head down and try to drive. And saw Ginobili there in the lane, but I never thought he would actually try to go up and block it. Because uh, I thought he's just going to let me lay it in. And we had to foul. And he really went up. And all that just try to hang on and, and try to go as strong as I could. And, and when the ball bounced in, I was like, oh, man, we, we got we got fortunate there. And then um, they actually had a chance to win it, and Ginobili drove and uh, kind of missed it. And that was still, to the day, one of the greatest wins, I think, in, in my career down there. Just uh, the magnitude of the game and beat them and, and on their home court was uh, an amazing feeling. Was there anything special about it because it was a rival and you already lost to them? twice before in the playoffs? Yeah, I mean, they're, they were always, like I mentioned, uh, our big brother, you know, they always kind of beat up on us and uh, sort of for us to go there and, 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 you know, grind with them the entire series and then find a way at the end uh, to, to grind it out. And after Ginobili made that three, it was as loud and as crazy as, as you can imagine uh, in NBA arena to be. So it was... Um, that was, that was unbelievable for us to come back and then really steal it in, in OT. And I remember Stack had some big plays. And I think he had two big shots in overtime. So uh, that was, uh, yeah, it was, I'll, I'll never forget not only the game seven, but that, that entire series was probably some of the best basketball I've played in my life. In the conference finals, we've already talked about scoring 50 points in a game. But in a playoff game, with the season basically on the line, that's some super special stuff. Oh, for three. Yes. Phoenix was always special games, not only because Steve went there and, and, you know, there was always a, a little friction there when he came here. He wanted to show Mark that we made a mistake as a franchise, so he was always super hyped to play us and, uh, and really stick it to us. So um, there was that going, and then their style of play was always... They're never out of it, and they're always in it, and the down, up, they always play the same. They keep coming and keep shooting, and so there, there was always fun games, fun matchups. I knew coming in that was going to be an incredible series with some incredible playmaking. We're up early in that game, and they, here they come making a run. Tim Thomas make threes. They're all making threes, and we're, we're kind of falling behind. And, and I'm thinking, you don't want to go to Phoenix down 3-2. You know, all this great work we've done. We beat San Antonio in, in, in their place, and this could all be forgotten. So I just kind of said, hey, it's, it's now or never. you got to go for it and, and make some stuff happen. Picking my spots, being aggressive. The guys kept finding me in, in, in good spots, and uh, I was getting, getting hot at the right time. And um, that, was, that was a huge win, and then we, we closed them out there in, in six. So... That was, uh, yeah, that was another special night. You spent your whole career with the Mavericks. A special night against the Nets, March 2008. Here's the play, fourth quarter. You become the franchise's all-time leading scorer, passing Rolando. Five on the shot clock. Here it is. Yeah, I mean, crazy. It's been at that point. It's already been uh, been a crazy ride in uh, in one franchise, uh, which you know I never really expected uh, anything like it in uh, my NBA career that I can stay 
I'll make it to the first contract and then be here so long. Um, pass uh, some of the Dallas greats, and everybody knew what was on the line there. And then I think I missed the one before, and, and they gave me the ball again. And I had like four minutes left to kind of get it, you know, just keep the ball and give it to me, and, and somehow make it happen. So I uh, shot that little turner on over over RJ, and it just uh, I'm just happy it went in. Dirk, when you came to the NBA, I remember you talking about one of your dreams was to get Germany to qualify to play in the Olympics. You guys did that in the summer of 2008. You went to Beijing to represent Germany, and you had a chance to carry the German flag for the opening ceremonies when the entire Olympic team made the walk into the stadium. What do you remember about that experience? Yeah, I mean, it's still, that experience still gives me goosebumps. You know, it was uh, one of the greatest experiences ever. Uh, and I'll remember it for, for the rest of my life. It was always a dream of mine, and so my international career started in uh, kind of 99, and we were trying to qualify for Sydney, and we missed it by like a couple points. Then we're trying to go to Athens. We missed that by a couple points, and it's always like, this is my dream, and I want it so bad. So then in 08, um, you know, we were the last last spot to take it. We had to go through this, this pre-Olympic qualifier that summer, and we had to grind through for like two weeks. We were in Athens, and then we, we actually beat JJ in Puerto Rico in, in the final game. Winner goes, loser stays home. So it was, it was a huge game, uh, and, and somehow we, we got the job done. It was, uh, it was amazing. I mean, I remember running off the court with, with tears in my eyes, and I couldn't, I couldn't hold back. It was, just so happy and then um, a couple weeks later we, we went to Beijing and uh, one day we were, we were going to do a little sightseeing and the head of the uh, German Olympic Committee is like uh, hey I want to talk to you today this afternoon and I was like what so, so I couldn't go to the, to the sightseeing tour and I go in his office he's like uh, I think we want you to carry the flag and I was like what are you guys crazy like you know usually it's these old guys that have done been like four or five six Olympics and uh, and, and so that was uh, was kind of breaking the, the habit and the routine. So uh, I said, listen, if I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but if, uh, if it's okay, I'd, I'd love to do it. It'll be an honor for me. And then, uh, yeah, they, they really gave me the flag. And it was, uh, I'll never forget the moment. You know, you wait around forever. There's all these nations that walk in. So we actually waited in the, I think, at the gymnast stadium or something. You just sit there for hours and hours. And then the moment finally comes, and we walk into the stadium, they kind of hand me the flag, and we're standing in this little tunnel. It was literally 120 degrees, <laughs> so humid. I was sweating through. My collar was all messed up. I mean, I was a mess. And all of a sudden, I'm just standing there, we're waiting, and then and in, in, in this tunnel, the entire German Federation starts singing, like, Dur, show me the flag. So I'm up there, I'm just waving the flag, and all four or five hundred Germans behind me are singing the song, and I'm just, I'm just starting to sweat. I'm just trying to get, a, starting to get emotional. It was uh, just such a surreal moment that, that I'll never forget. And then actually the round, I can't remember at all. It kind of was a daze. It was hot, I was sweating, uh, you know, the, the whole round kind of went by way too quick, but I'll always remember that, that those 10, 15 seconds and you know, 30 seconds in the tunnel where, where the whole Federation was singing, and, uh, that was uh, an unbelievable special moment. We had a blast um, just in the village, getting to know some of these athletes, uh, you know, just to... Everything around it uh, was, was an amazing, amazing experience. I'll, I'll never trade it for anything. November of 2009. 29 points in the fourth quarter against Utah. What a quarter that was. Yeah, that's another thing that uh, I won't forget for the rest of my life. Really had nothing going to three quarters. You know, Utah was a, a tough physical team. They're, they were talented, and, um, and they really took it to us there, and we were kind of down big there in the fourth. We talked about it in the huddle before the fourth. Uh, let's try to make it one more run. Just happened to get hot. Kavitsky. scores in the foul. He's trying to take it. Had some good plays. Got into it a couple times with some, with some layups at the beginning. 
I had an N1 right, right out of the, the quarter and, and kind of got me started. I don't know, just kept rolling from there and the, the rest was kind of like whatever, just throw the ball towards me. And it's down to eight as Dirk somehow got it to go. I somehow make a, make a play for us and that was, was just that, uh, that kind of night. Either I'm getting fouled or I'm making this basket. That's, uh, that's the kind of night I was feeling there in the fourth. And they're calling Dirk's number again against Okor. Shot fakes, drives, in the paint, yes sir! Once you're in the midst of it, I didn't even know how many points I had at the time. I was just trying to keep going, keep going, trying to get this win. And, and then when I subbed out, I think I remember single, you know, somebody told me uh, you just had 29 in the fourth, so that was, uh, that was ridiculous. And, um, but also a great, great night and a great win. When you go to that place where you just got hot, can you share with us what that feeling is like? It's just the, the ultimate confidence. There's some doubts once in a while. You miss a few when you're on. It's just zero doubt that the next shot's going in. You just want the competition. You want the ball. You want to make it happen. You don't even think about misses or anything. You just, uh, you, you know you're on. You know the next shot's going in. So you're, you're just trying to chase the ball. And they're calling Dirk's number again against Okor. Shot fakes, drives, in the paint. Yes, sir. Just in the mindset of, I'm making this happen. Nobody can guard me out here, and uh, no matter what happens, I'm uh, I'm trying to carry us and get this win. One of your great individual performances in the playoffs, Game One, Western Conference Finals, Oklahoma City, 2011. 48 points. What a night you had against the Thunder. That was great. You know, we had just swept the Lakers, so we were sitting on I think over a week off. You know, you know how Holger is. He literally gave me maybe one day off, and the rest we were in the gym every night, every night in the gym. So I couldn't wait to get this series started. Right? I'm like, I gotta go away from Holger. I gotta get this series started. You know, just was so anxious to get get going and get the Western Conference Finals started. They are ready, and their team is back in the Western Conference Finals. It's game. Made my first kind of couple shots, and then I had a great groove for the, for the rest of the night. And put some small defenders on me, had some matchups. Uh, I was able to shoot over them some, and that was a great night. Something I'll always remember from that series was after you won the series in Game 5 at American Airlines Center, your celebration for the Western Conference Championship Trophy was very, very understated. Can you take us back to that place and why why your demeanor was like that that night? So Doris Burke interviewed me right after the game, so I thought I was done with the interviews with her. And so I did the interview. Well, now we got a bunch of veterans that want to win and play off each other, so we'll see how it goes. Congratulations, sir. Mike. We got the, the trophy, and it was, it was great. And then I was like, okay, you know, I want to get ready for, for the next series. And, we already have a Western Conference Championship thing, and that's uh, not really what, what we're here to play for. You know, we'd love to get the Larry O'Brien trophy in here. So I was kind of done celebrating and just walked off the floor, and then I found out later that Doris wanted to interview me live on the mic for the fans, which I didn't know. If, if I would have known that she wanted to do that, I would have obviously stayed out there. So it was kind of like a weird look. I guess she was looking for me. Well, we've got a lot of work left. Thank, Thank you very much. Dirk? I had already left, so I, I did not do that on, on purpose, trying to make a statement, hey, we're not celebrating. I would have obviously stayed if I would have known. To me, yeah, this, this was a great win, but at the end of the day, it's still just another series we won, and, and we wanted to get one more series, so that, that's how that happened. To the game winner. This is when you tied it against Miami. You know, they were really, really good. They were really athletic. And I, I think they kind of took us out of our games. The first, first game and the second, really, they were all over us. Um, they took some of our shooting away with their quickness on the perimeter, with their athleticism. And so really we had nothing going the first two games. And, and, and then D. Wade made the three in front of our bench. I think they go up 15 or 16. Three from Wade. And the Heat have pulled this game open. And 
it's just one of those nights we didn't really have it. You know, all we said in the last five, six minutes, hey, let's try to get some stops, maybe get a run out, get a couple easy ones, and, and somehow get it to 10 and, and see if we can make one last run at it. If not, come back to AAC, hopefully to a rocking crowd, and uh, get on the board. And then that's what she tried to do. last couple minutes were were magic for us i mean we're just scrambling up the game where we were we were kind of you know hard playing through some of the mistakes defensively and uh, got some good bounces and then offensively finally got some easy ones i remember jet had a layup in transition he had another pull up and then and somehow that got us going they got got our offensive swag back a little bit and uh started to make some shots and, and uh and some big plays and they've sliced 11 points off the lead in just three minutes and, and finally i think that's when we really arrived into the finals you know before that we we're kind of like oh they're so good I'm not sure where we can beat them and, and those last couple minutes were really hey we're, we're here we're here to play and that was a huge comeback win, you know, down 15 with a couple minutes to go. That, that usually doesn't happen, um, but we made it happen by scrambling together, by, by fighting and, and getting going offensively. And then I tied in on a layup and fast break. We kept running this uh, one of the same plays, which was like a double screen, and then they really showed hard, and then Tyson kind of screened his own man. That's why I got so open. And I was able to knock the three down, and we're like, yes, you know, so, sort of 20-something seconds to go. We're up three, you know, now we're in great position. And Chet just had a complete brain fart on, on the other end. Kind of like, you know, Dwayne cuts to the high to the high post and, you know, he kind of completely leaves, uh, leaves his guy in the corner, didn't even think about him. And sure enough, LeBron skips it over from out of bounds and uh, it's a tie game again. And I was just like, how in the heck did he get so open? I remember Jay Kidd looking around, and we didn't really know what happened, and the Jets kind of looking at us. So um, that was that was a weird situation from kind of like being completely up on a high to, to kind of like, are you kidding me? And then, but we were still in a good spot. You know, it's it's a tie game. Um, you know, almost can run the clock down, and you know that's that's the position you want to be in. You know, if if you miss. Worst thing that can happen is, is go to overtime. If, if, if you lay it in or, or make a shot, you can win it. So it's kind of like a no pressure, pressure situation. They had Bosch on me and, you know, just got the ball there, had ran a little uh, down pick, and I came up to the, the elbow area where, where I've lived basically my entire career. And You know, Bosch used his length really well that series, so all I was trying to do, get him off me a little bit, and I spun. And once I spun, I just saw a gap there. You know, usually I think it was Haslam under there, would have come over, maybe try to take a charge or something, but once I spun, I think the, the, the lane was just open, and, and I just saw it, and I took it, and I was able to get to the basket and lay it in, and then it was kind of like scrambling. They didn't have enough timeout left, and uh, they had to push it up, and. Uh, and Wade had a heave that, that actually almost went in. Wade puts it up for the win! Off the mark, and Dallas has tied the finals! Was one of the most incredible comebacks in NBA Finals history! That was a big win, and, and, and really showed us that we, we, can, we can beat this team, we can play with this team, and we, uh, we had arrived in the finals for sure. What do you remember about Game 4? The game you won at American Airlines Center, but you had to play through being very, very sick that night. Uh, we were so frustrated given the home court advantage right back that we had just earned um so that was that was frustrating i was like hey we're, we're still right here we're right here and then the night before big game four uh you know i knew our season was sort of on the line if we lose again we're down three one this, this might be it and so i'm, I'm i worked out with holger at night and i go home and eat and um like 11 12 o'clock i was like i'm not feeling that well i'm sweating a little bit i'm getting hot and then the entire night, you know, had a, had a fever and just uh, did not feel good at all. I think it was just so frustrated. I was like, not now, you know, get sick in preseason or whatever, even in the first round, but not right now. You know, this is maybe your most important time of your career right now. Maybe your last shot at an NBA title, you know, well, why now, you know? So it's uh, so frustrated coming in the morning, not feeling well. And, 
pushed my fluids that day. I even did the oxygen chamber in the afternoon, kind of laid in there. I think that helped me get some rest. And, uh, and then in the evening, I, I gave it all I had, you know, just uh, I was able to knock a few shots in, but I really was not great. I was not great, but um, I was there, was out there. We were battling. Um, and at the end, I just I remember that, that was kind of my my last burst of energy. I think we're, we're up one, and I had the ball again, this time on, on the right elbow. And I'm kind of looking at the clock, and uh, I'm just like, he's kind of, Haslam was giving me right a lot because he knows I like going left. So I went a little early, um, but I just saw that opening. I saw that opening, I took it, and I was just hoping my body would have enough strength left for me somehow to stumble there and then lay it in and, and I did get there and, and I think Wade came from the weak side and almost almost got to it but it somehow snuck in and uh, I was just so happy afterwards that, that we got that win and uh, we got through that that game and we tied in and I didn't feel well but we, we somehow got the job done. Game six, uh, I was awful. You know, I just I tried to force it a bit. I think I was like, this is such a big moment, go make it happen. And I tried to will it, and it just wasn't working for me. You know, everything was a little long. They contested it well, forced me to some tough shots. I was one for 12 at halftime and just just being frustrated. But you know, the great thing is the guys were playing great. I think Jet was unbelievable that night, and we were still up at halftime. So I'm coming at halftime. I'm sort of obviously ticked off, and nothing's going my way. And I just see Cardinal like, yes. I remember like this, and I was like, what What are you doing? He's like. You're getting all your misses out of the way. I love it. You know how Cardinal was, and he just made me smile, and, and it kind of just, I guess, it kind of just relaxed me and, uh, and went out there and was able to make a few shots or a few plays there in, in the second half. Novitski, left hand, lays it in, and it's 103-92, and that should do it for the Dallas Mavericks. I totally thought it was a, a great team series that uh, that we played, and some of the guys played uh, played great uh, to get us over the hump. And... Turnover, Dallas ball, and the Mavericks will do it. Yeah, when I put my hand over the head, I think we we had it we had it in, uh, out of reach. So uh, I kind of knew then, yeah, this this was it. This is the moment. I remember just going like this, and I was, uh, is this really happening? And I remember Jet uh, came over and I gave him like a complete uncomfortable weird hug, but I was just, I didn't really, so I tapped him, I think, on the head. Uh, it was just so bizarre. But I think, you know, if we had won it in 06, I think the, the party would have been a lot bigger. I think there in 11, we had an older team. I think everybody was just so exhausted. You know, we were, we were all, you know, a playoff run takes a lot out of you. Uh, two months, you're completely always on the edge. Win or lose, you know, you don't want to lose the momentum when you win. You don't want to regain it when you lose. So you, you don't sleep for two months. And I was just, I remember I was just being exhausted. I was being happy. Um, but uh, at that moment, yeah, for sure, we, I know this, this was out of reach. And, uh, just uh, being exhausted and happy at the same time. Sean Marion dribbles it out, and the celebration will begin. And winning it all was, was sort of surreal. The Dallas Mavericks are NBA champions. I just wanted to get off the court for a second. I wanted to run in the back. I ran to the, the shower area. There was a little bench, and I laid down. And I remember, uh, you know, Tim Franks from the NBA uh, PR guy followed me. I was like, hey, you got to go out there. You got to go out there. And I was like, I, I can't. I don't want the trophy. Give it to somebody else. Uh, I, I need a couple minutes. And then... Um, uh, finally, after a few minutes, he, he convinced me I came out there, and uh, I'm happy I did. I mean, this picture is, uh, I'll never forget either, raising the trophy, you know, having uh, Mark there, the whole team, family on stage. I mean, that was, uh, that was an incredible moment. We're over six years removed from it, but I would imagine that the relationships with those that you fought with, your teammates, your brothers, still have to be amazing and always will for the rest of your life. Yeah, they always say it's it's sort of a bond for life, and it's, yeah, it's true. I mean, every time you, you see one of those old warriors, it, it just makes you smile. You know, we, we saw Pager a couple weeks ago in Sackville throw your 
You know, whether you see Corey Brewer or Tyson, uh, Karan Butler always say, what up, champ, when I see him. I mean, it's just, it's, it's always great to see some of these guys with, you know, you fought through so much and so much adversity. And um, I was, uh, that was a special year, a special bond we have with that group. It was a group that was anything but favorites going in, but it was a group that, that wanted to play with each other, that, that sincerely loved each other and played well with each other and, and shared the ball and wanted to win with each other. And it was just, uh, that was a special group for sure. a lot of people on the scoring list. Let's look at the video from November of 2014. This was a special night. Sacramento's here at American Airlines Center. It is not a dream. He's passed Akeem Olajuwon and is the highest scoring foreign-born player in NBA. Business. Yeah, and I was uh, watching basketball uh, in the 90s. I uh, was a huge uh, dream fan, you know. His, his footwork next, next to no other. Uh, just um, just an unbelievable player and you know to me sort of still surreal passing some of these all-time greats legends that uh, that I've watched that I've adored uh, for so long that I've that I've idolized um, so it was uh, it was another surreal moment you know that uh, the kid from from Wurzburg the lanky kid uh, you know 16, 17, 18 years later, passes uh, some of these greats. It's, uh, it was uh, another surreal moment, and I think that really is going to sink in um, once my career is over in 10, 20 years, and I look back and, and show some of my kids and grandkids, hopefully, and um, then it will be really, really sweet. Baseline, jab, step, up, fake, it is. I felt the, the buzz in the crowd. Every time I touched it, they were like, shoot, 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 make something happen. Uh, they were standing up, and I just, I just said, let's go for it. Let's go for it tonight, early and often. And then I made, I remember back-to-back -back threes, and it was just kind of on from there. And then I was sitting on 18 uh, after the first quarter, and Carla is obviously, uh, we're breaking this now, and the first play, was a nice little play where I set a, uh, a down pick and to get a cross screen into a shot. I've, I've run the play a thousand times. It could happen at any moment. The moment was just awesome, and I turned around, and I was like, here it is. Dirt gets free, baseline jumper. He puts it up and overshoots everything. And it was way long, and it was an air ball, so the entire crowd was like, oh, my God. So, but they kept standing, and then the second player I came down, they were like, let's just punch it to him. Easy play call. Devin brings it down, punch it in, and, and make something happen on their low block, as, as I've been doing for a long, long time. And Dirk got one shot. He's about to get another. And I wasn't sure, should I back down, or what should I do? Should I do the, the flamingo shot, or should I do that? Or just like, all sorts of stuff going through your mind, and then I just ended up facing up. I was like, screw it, let's, let's get this over with. He was kind of close to me, but his hands were a little down, and I was like, let's just, just, let's just shoot it and, and see what happens. It went in, and it was, it was incredible. The crowd went nuts. I saw my bench over there. I was completely almost running on the court. Yeah, it was a fantastic moment. Then in the timeout after, sitting there, watching some of the tribute. They had one in German and, and one in English. And then seeing Holger up there with tears in his eyes. I had a couple of friends from Germany in town, and I, I looked at them uh, across. They were kind of across the bench. They were going bonkers over there, absolutely loving it, and that they witnessed that. So that, that was a special moment I'll, I'll never forget. Of all the players, of all the great players that, uh, that played this game, that, uh, that did mean a lot to me. Um, and that was, uh, that was a special night. One of the really special moments from that night, one of the poignant moments was, and you just mentioned it, how emotional Holger got that night. 
He's a very stoic man. He doesn't show his emotion very often. But to see him emotional and to reflect on the journey that you two have had together, what did you feel that night seeing the pride that he had and the path that you two have traveled? Yeah, it obviously made me a little emotional. You know, if uh, we've been through a ton together on and off the courts. So we've had some times where we annoyed each other. I mean, like in every friendship and relationship. And uh, but he's been there every step of the way, you know, supporting me. And sometimes I have to remind myself, hey, he he, he only wants the best for you, you know. He was always there, uh, pushing me through thick and thin. And uh, you know, it's probably fair to say I would I would have never gotten here without him. I was happy for for him to be there in that in that moment. And you know, I've only seen him emotional a couple times and. In whatever 25 years I've known him now, uh, and, and the championship was one, and uh, and the 30K was was another. So uh, great, uh, great moments and great memories. He talks about this, and he embraces the fact that his methodology of teaching is unique in terms of what we're accustomed to seeing the sport taught like here in America. Has there ever been a time whenever he was saying, "I want you to do this," and your reaction was, "You want me to do what?" Yeah, I think when we first started off, I was like 15, 16, and the stuff that he was saying was just completely absurd. I've never, I've never heard some of that stuff. And his his terminology about about certain things. You know, Germany is a soccer country. Every time at the beginning somebody would shoot, he's like goal. He would scream goal uh, for some reason, and we would all look at him like, who is this weirdo standing over there in his leather coat in the gym? So it was like us young guys, as we are uh, teenagers, uh, we thought he was a little uh, bizarre is a good word. Uh, and then we, we got to know him, got to work with him more, and, and um, we just saw basically his, his stuff works, his technique stuff works. He knows what he's talking about. We all got better. You know, it wasn't only just me he was working with. Uh, he was working with some other young guys and the rest of the team. So. Uh, we kind of embraced his methods and his, his, his terminology of, of stuff and, and just grew close to him. And, you know, the rest is history. We became, became great friends. He's been a mentor. And, you know, I've traveled the world with him. You know, there's not a lot of guys that uh, would travel the world with a 60-year-old man, uh, but I did, and he showed me unbelievable places in the world. And, um, just a great friend and a great mentor over, over a long, long time. Why did this relationship between Dirk Nowitzki and the city of Dallas, Texas materialize the way that it did? I don't know if, uh, if I brought some, some hope. Nowitzki fires for three. Oh, baby. I'm not sure if they like the shy, skinny kid that came from Germany. It's uh, not really supposed to make it. My first year it was obviously rough. Every time I did come off the bench, I remember the crowd was giving me standing ovation. That showed me, hey, they, they want me to succeed. You know, I got I to gotta do everything in my power to, to kind of make that happen, to, to pay them, them back, their loyalty, their love. What would you want people to say when they speak historically about what you meant to the NBA and to the Mavericks? He's a big guy that, that could shoot, that could move, that changed the game in a way, helped pave the way for, for some of the younger Europeans now, love playing the game and help this team, help the city, help this franchise win games. That's really it. Always try to be out there and, and help, my, help my team win games. Over the last hour, Dirk has told us the stories of some of the amazing moments in his career. It's hard to boil down 20 seasons into just a few memories. And we could have spent hours, maybe even days, revisiting all of the games and plays that have made Dirk into one of the all-time greats. Thanks for joining us for the defining moments of Dirk.